Well, if you will, take your Bible and look with me to the book of Jonah as we continue to look at some of these, what they call minor prophets. But it's only minor in that they're short books, as we saw last time with the prophet Obadiah. And I've entitled this message, Christ in the Book of Jonah. And yes, I've noted here we're going to go through the four chapters that we have here. We can't do so exhaustively, but my prayer is that we find enough here in what we're going to look at that it'll give you some interest to go back and read a little bit further as to this book of Jonah. It has a very captivating narrative and story that goes beyond just the surface of telling a tale of Jonah and the whale. I remember as a kid, that was always interesting to hear that particular story. But it's really rich with very much scriptural teaching concerning how it is that God works in his sovereignty for the salvation of sinners and how he is merciful well beyond what people imagine or think. Remember that one of the reasons in the end of the book that Jonah said that he did not want to go to Nineveh to preach was because he knew God would be merciful. And you say, well, why would he say that? Well, he was going to preach to Gentiles, the Assyrians. Nineveh was the capital at the time. And that was an offense to him until the Lord changed his heart. So here we embark on this study of Jonah. And I want to, first of all, give a little history, delve into the historic context of the book. That's important. And then take a look at the four chapters, what the structure is, how these four chapters are laid out. And then, of course, more importantly, most importantly, is the doctrine of Christ, what this teaches us of God's purpose in the, the saving of sinners through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, and when we read these, sometimes we just read right over, but this is a good time to pause whenever you are given the information that we're given, particularly in the first parts of these books or in the epistles, the salutations. And there's no scripture that's just given in vain. Every word is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. And so here, when it says now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and notice, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And then it says, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. If you get a map out, well, that was just the exact opposite direction from heading up to Nineveh through Assyria. And it says that he rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Yes, we are foolish in our nature, even as God's children. And we are prone to wander. But thankfully, even in this, Jonah would not have his way. God would sovereignly work in ensuring that even though Jonah took this detour, thinking to flee to Tarshish and not to Nineveh, Yet he arrived exactly at the time that God had purposed, not one minute before, not one minute, one minute afterward. So there we see his sovereignty. You can't get ahead of God, and you can't drag behind him. But he went down to Joppa, and it says he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish 
Notice, from the presence of the Lord. I don't think he was so foolish to think he could get away from God's presence, but I believe the indication is there from the direction of how the Lord was directing. He went hard the other way. Now to grasp the full impact of Jonah's story, it's crucial to understand this historic setting of the book. Actually, the book is set during the reign of Jeroboam II. And uh, he would have been one of the kings that separated themselves out from the rest of the children of the tribes of Judah, the ten tribes, and went and established a center up in Samaria and introduced the worship of the golden calves again. But it was marked by both a period of political prosperity for the ten tribes of the north. There's a lesson even in that, how God can prosper a people for a while, even though they are rebels and idolaters. A great example is our own country, and I dare say most countries today are prospering far beyond what they deserve, and yet they are idolaters. But that doesn't mean that God does not have his purpose in judgment and will in time bring every nation down in its idolatry and bring judgment. So even though it was a time of political prosperity and peace in Israel, yet it was a time of moral decline. And so this backdrop provides the context for Jonah's reluctance to deliver a message to the Assyrian city of Nineveh because this was Israel's historic enemy. But we know that in time, the Lord would strengthen the Assyrians to come down into Israel and actually take the 10 tribes of the north into captivity and remove them. So Jonah prophesied here, if you like, like I do, I like to put a, a date in a book to see the context. And Jonah would have prophesied somewhere around 785 years before Christ. And this would have been during the reign of Jeroboam II. So when you, when you know that it was in 722 before Christ that the Assyrians came and captured Samaria. They besieged it and brought the city down and, and literally cleaned out the, the northern tribes of Israel. This would have been then 63 years before the Assyrians were raised up to capture the city of Samaria. Here it says he was the son of Amittai. If you study Amittai, you would know and see that this would have been a place in Galilee, in the northern part of Israel, where Jonah would have lived and been raised. And Amittai was from the city of Gath Hefer. And this is interesting, I think, that it was located just a few miles north of Nazareth. What's important about Nazareth? Well, Jesus of Nazareth. So many years later, it would be here that our Lord Jesus himself would go about preaching the kingdom. But that would have been 600 some years later after this took place. Now, if we're going to study the book, I always like when I study a book to look at the layout of the book. <clears throat> and so even in how Jonah is written and the literary structure of the book is of significance. It's a short book. It consists of four chapters. And when you read the chapters, each one has a very distinct purpose. I believe that chapters one and two, and it doesn't take long to read. You can 
take and even after this message, sit down and read through the entire book. It wouldn't take that long to read. But chapters 1 and 2 focus on Jonah's attempt to escape God's call and his subsequent time in the belly of the fish. So those all form one theme and one unit, chapters 1 and 2. Notice I specifically said Jonah's attempt to escape. You can't get away from God. You can run, but you can't hide. And I've often said that many times if we determine to go our own way, God gives you just enough rope to hang yourself. We used to have a clothesline across our backyard, and we'd go out and tie our dog up to it and have a long enough chain. And that dog thought that as long as he could run the length of that yard that he was free, but all of a sudden he'd get to the end of it and he'd pull him back. And I liken that in many ways to what God purposes for us. There's times when we think that we're getting away with things, not that we would want to, but, you know, that's why we're sheep, described as sheep. All we like sheep have, what, gone our own way. But the Lord has laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity of us all that are his sheep. You don't find sheep marching in lockstep. <laughs> you find them wandering, but that's why they need a shepherd. That's why we all do. So chapters 1 and 2 of Jonah show his attempt to escape from what God has purposed. And we can identify. There's times when the Lord has laid certain things on our hearts. And we know that it is what the Lord is directing us to do. But we resist. We don't like change. We don't like things that are outside of our comfort zone. And so we wrestle with the Lord. If you're not wrestling in your own flesh and will with the Lord, I dare say you are probably not alive. Because where there's life in this flesh, there's going to be a struggle. Even as what Paul wrote about in Romans 7. He didn't write that as being a pre-conversion state when he said, The things I would do, I do not. And the things I do not, those I do, I would not do, I do. We all have this particular struggle, but in the end, and this is one of the themes of the book of Jonah, God always has his way. And you can't get ahead of him, and you certainly can't follow far behind. But that's chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 3 then gives us the narration of Jonah's preaching in Nineveh, where he went into the city and preached. And the Lord granted repentance to the Ninevites. That's an amazing thing right there. That here they were the enemy of Israel. Here was a Jew that the Lord had brought into their presence. And yet gave them a hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You wonder what it was he was declaring. He would have been declaring the word that the Lord gave him to declare. And the call to repentance is always a call to turn to the one true God, as he's revealed in the scriptures, even the Lord Jesus Christ. These prophets of the Old Testament, they weren't just preaching a generic message of turning to God, but their message would have been the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that because of what Peter wrote when he said that they had the spirit of Christ in them and they spoke of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So he would have been preaching the coming one, the one who was to come to whom hearts would be turned and none other than the Son of God. And then the fourth chapter gives us Jonah's reaction. To God's mercy. When it says there in chapter 4 and verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Here's an example too. That you might preach the truth and the gospel. But not have the right attitude in doing it. Now, if 
think any of us that have preached, we can look back at times when we were angry. We laid out the message, but our spirit wasn't right. And yet the Lord blessed, not because of us, but blessed the message. And certainly Jonah would be an example of that, that nothing would inhibit God from accomplishing his purpose for which he raised up Jonah, but also Jonah was to learn that just as he preached repentance to the others, he himself was in need of that repentance. But as I said, the real reason for studying this particular book is for what it teaches us of Christ. And that's the purpose of every bit of scripture. If we just go through Jonah and tell a story of Jonah and the whale, but don't bring out how this typifies the Lord Jesus Christ in his life and death and resurrection, then we will have missed the message of the book. And for that, I would have us look over now to a couple of references in the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12. This is the one portion of Scripture in the New Testament where when we read it, we see the significance of Jonah. And we see God's providence even in this because had he not been going the wrong direction... And taking that ship, he would not then have been overthrown or thrown overboard into the water. And we would not then have had the great fish that God prepared to swallow him up. And ultimately would not have had the lesson of what this was to teach. But here in Matthew 12, we have God's word describing exactly what is the significance here of the story of Jonah? Matthew chapter 12. And the Lord's addressing here the unbelieving Pharisees of his day. He said there in verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So he is addressing here a rebellious and unbelieving nation, even though they had the scriptures. These were hardened sinners. And it says in verse 38, then, I'll begin, Matthew 12, certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. It wasn't that who he was and why he had come wasn't clear enough, but they still demanded a sign as a reason not to believe. And he answered and said unto them, verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. My, how that should be said in our day, because people all asking for signs and wonders and pursuing these things. And the Lord says only a, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, after the clear testimony of Scripture that we have, pointing sinners to Christ, and they still want something extra or more, that just shows the rebellion of the heart. And here our Lord is very specific when he says, there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So that's where now in the New Testament we come back and look at Jonah and think, wow, all of this was purposed to be a sign of how it is God would save sinners. Here was Christ himself in the flesh standing before this wicked and adulterous generation. And they would not believe him, but still wanted another sign. So the Lord said, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Even the timing of Jonah being swallowed up in the time that he spent in the belly of that whale 
and then his being vomited out on the land. All of that was foreordained by God to serve as a sign of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when his son would die and be buried for exactly three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then rise again. <clears throat> and it says in verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Who was the queen of the south? That was Queen Sheba, that hearing of Solomon's glory went to study it out and to seek it out and was amazed at how God had blessed Solomon, Solomon being a type of Christ himself. And she said the half had not been told. And she wasn't even from Israel. That's the condemnation here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation. He's talking about condemning the, the Jews and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, what a greater than Solomon is here. There's your key in studying the scriptures. It's one greater even than Jonah that is there. One greater than Solomon when we study all of the kings and prophets of the Old Testament and priests. They were all types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see then the Lord using this as a sign. And it goes on some more to, to, to uh, other verses. But look in Matthew chapter 16. I want us just to look at what pertains to our study here. Matthew chapter 16. Here again, who is it? These are religious leaders. They boasted in having the scriptures. And in Matthew 16, 1, it says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. The Lord had, well, the scriptures had said that when the Messiah would come, it would be with signs and wonders. Well, he was doing these. He was healing the sick and raising the dead. The lame were walking. All of these were indications that he was the Messiah, but it wasn't the one they were seeking. And so they were never satisfied. They always wanted one more. And that's when the Lord scolded them in verse 2 he answered and said unto them when it is evening evening he say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering O ye hypocrites you can discern the face of the sky but can ye not discern the signs of the times you want a sign well here it is, verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. That's the second time. And he left them and departed. It. departed. It's another way of, of saying, well, it's all right there in the scripture. And here we have a good example, I believe, when people contest over the matter of salvation, how God saves sinners in his sovereignty and how it's through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And, and you hear them saying, yes, but. I always tell them that goats, but sheep bleat. When they hear the Savior, they cry after him, but goats are always butting. Yes, but. Well, what are we to do? Just leave them alone. You have the scriptures, go read them. And that's what our Lord did. He left them and departed. That's not a good thing. When the Lord leaves sinners to themselves and departs, unless he's pleased to come again by his spirit and draw them to himself, that is for their condemnation. Then there's one other passage over in Mark chapter 8 that says pretty much the same thing, but I wanted to show you the significance of the book of Jonah from the New Testament and uh, what it teaches concerning Christ and God's salvation in him. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 12, 
<clears throat> Again, it says in verse 11 that the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, but notice, tempting him. They weren't really interested. They were just tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. There he didn't even mention Jonah to these. He just simply declared that he was who he was. And uh, these were ones who boasted in having a knowledge of scriptures. And no other sign would be given than that. Now when we come back here to Jonah, the book of Jonah. And as I said in the beginning, I'm just giving a survey here. But I did want to speak with you about some of the similarities that we find between Jonah and Christ, knowing that he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've read, but then also some of the differences. And I've written down seven similarities and seven differences. And we'll just be able to touch on these briefly. But first of all, as far as similarities are concerned between Christ and Jonah, when he was cast overboard and coming back then when those mariners were crying out, and uh, you can see that in uh, chapter 1, they knew something was up. They were used to storms in the sea, but they'd never seen one like this. And when Jonah, in verse 12, told them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So here we have an example of Jonah being willing to sacrifice himself in order that they be delivered. So there's the first similarity that I see between Jonah and Christ. And even though initially they didn't want to do it in verse 15 of Jonah 1, they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And what? The sea ceased from her raging. Can you see how that's a type, even that, of Christ and his sacrifice for his people? And that when he was sacrificed, the sea ceased from her raging. The wrath of God was appeased on behalf of those that Christ represented. And it says in verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and notice, offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. These were idolaters, and yet here they understood, even in this brief encounter with Jonah, that nothing less than a sacrifice unto the Lord would appease the Lord. And uh, then verse 17, The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Can you imagine all that sea the volumes of water, and yet right where they cast Jonah in, the Lord had already prepared a fish to come and swallow him up. And it says there in verse 17 that he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So the comparisons continue. First of all, with Jonah willingly sacrificing himself, that's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ being thrown into the sea to save the sailors. Just like Christ's willingness. He, did, he went willingly to the cross. And sacrificed himself in order to save that people that the Father had given him. But secondly, the similarity with the three days and three nights. You, you can't read that in conjunction with what we saw in the New Testament and not see the similarity. Both Jonah and Christ spent three days and three nights in a significant place. Jonah... He was in the belly of the fish. Christ was in the tomb before his resurrection. But all of that was necessary for the fulfillment of the scriptures. And Christ, wherever he went, told the people that he would suffer and die. But three days and three nights later, he would rise again. And that's exactly what happened. But thirdly, there's a similarity in the call to repentance with regard to the message. When Jonah was 
released and went forth to preach the gospel, both the message of Jonah and that of Christ was repentance. When Christ began to preach, he, re -pre he preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And again, I will turn you to Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 as a good definition of repentance. It doesn't change what it was in the Old Testament. It is in the New. What is repentance? Well, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, Paul gives us an example where he declares that in verse 20, that he kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Even though we're not told specifically what Jonah preached as far as its content and detail, yet we do know he did preach repentance. And told the people that that was what God had commanded. It's a command. It's not an invitation. It's a command. But here in Acts 20 and verse 21, he says, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks. What was true for Israel would be true for Assyria. No matter where you go, the message does not change. And notice, it's repentance toward God. Here were the Assyrians that were worshiping a false god. And so it would require a change of gods. But then it says, and or even toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God is repentance toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are the same thing. People act like they're two separate things. No, they faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ is what repentance is. Toward the Lord Jesus Christ. A renouncing of any other savior or way of salvation than Christ. So that's the third way that we see a similarity between Jonah and Christ. Both delivered a message of repentance unto salvation. Jonah preached it to the Ninevites, and Christ made no distinction. Though he primarily went to the Jews, yet his message went beyond the boundaries of Israel. And even up in the northern part where Jonah was raised near Nazareth, there, there are was an area called the Decapolis. There were 10 cities. That's where the Lord removed himself and went and preached when Israelites, the, the people in Israel, chased him out of town. So the message was carried by Christ exactly to that people that God purposed. But number four, similarity, has to do with how each one faced death. Christ came into this world to lay down his life. And Jonah, when he was cast into the sea, he knew when he was cast in the sea, he didn't know that God had prepared a belly, a, a fish for him to dwell in for three days. As far as he knew, once he was cast into that sea, that was going to be it. So he faced the threat of death in the sea, but did so according to how God directed his heart and would, I would say, willingly was cast into. They didn't have to force him. In fact, they were hesitant even in casting him overboard. But when they said, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. That's when he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth in the sea. And so shall the, the sea be calm. I believe that in that we see a similarity of even how our Lord Jesus Christ faced the cross, faced that death that God purposed that he should die. He did not do it with fear and trembling or halting in any way, but the scriptures say he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and was determined to die that death because of the people that God purposed that he should save through that. And we can see even in the death that was accomplished. Jonah being, he didn't actually die, but it's symbolic being cast in the sea. 
he faced that death. In the end, there was a redemption that would follow as a result. And that's but a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, that when Christ faced death, it was for one purpose, that God the Father might redeem and justify by his death that people that the Father had given him. And then, fifthly, we see a similarity in that Jonah was rescued from the depths of the sea by God. Now, the depths of the sea represent to what degree he was plunged into that trial that he was to face. Some argue that he may well have died and come back to life in the belly of the fish, but the way that the scriptures describe it certainly depicts death when it says the waters in verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 the waters compass me about even to the soul i find that interesting because christ's suffering was a soul suffering and the death closed me around about the weeds were wrapped about my head all of that represents the affliction that he endured to what depths he went in being cast into the sea. It says, verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. What does that sound like to you? That well, sounds like what was described of Christ, that out of the depths of his death, he was brought forth, and it was not possible that his soul so it should see corruption. Here, verse 7, Jonah says, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto me into thine holy temple. Well, Christ is God's temple, and from the depths, Christ cried unto his Father that he should be delivered. And the writer of the Hebrew says, He was heard and that he feared. Not fear in the sense of being afraid, but that he feared God. So here, again, is a fifth way that I see some similarities in how Jonah was rescued from the depths of the sea by God. But Christ also was brought up out of the depths of death. It was necessary that he did die. And that through his resurrection from the dead. The sixth similarity would be in the compassion that each one had for the lost. Both Jonah and Christ exhibited compassion for those that were considered lost or sinful. You might say, well, then you can't really compare that because Jonah did hesitate to go and preach but the point is and that's why when you get over to Jonah chapter 3 he didn't hold back once he was brought into that city and declared the word unto them and it was a great city it says in Jonah 3 and verse 3 then it was an exceeding great city of three days journey in other words to walk from one end to the, the other and Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried, and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people, verse 5, believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Jonah would not have done this unwillingly. The Lord made him willing, even though initially he was unwilling. So in that we see a contrast with Christ because Christ was ever willing when he took on flesh and came in this world and traversed this world of Nineveh, a world of wickedness, yet he did not hesitate. In fact, it was out of compassion for those sinners that the Father had given him. Lost sinners, Scripture says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. How lost were the people of Nineveh? Had God not sent them a prophet, they would have died in their condemnation. How lost are those sinners for whom Christ came in the world? Without his work, 
without his death and without his spirit calling them to repentance, they would die the death of the unrighteous. So we see a similarity there in uh, the compassion of each for the lost. But the seventh similarity I find is in how the scriptures teach through parables. This was a true story that took place here. And yet we could say it was a type of parable because Jonah's experience served as a kind of living parable for the people of Nineveh. You can imagine, I believe, him in preaching what he did, telling his own story. I believe every servant of the Lord that the Lord raises up tells the story of how they had once been rebellious and had run headlong the opposite way from the Lord, running from his presence. And yet the Lord got hold of them and showed them their lost estate and turned them to Christ. I don't believe a preacher can preach repentance who has never truly been granted repentance. A preacher can't preach faith, that is Christ, unless the Lord has truly granted them faith. And so it was here, Jonah's experience served as a kind of living parable for the people of Nineveh. And when you come to the New Testament, that's exactly how Christ taught, through parables to convey the deeper meaning of his work and his person and what he came to accomplish. When they asked him why he taught in parables, he said that those that are without seeing, they might not see, and hearing, they might not hear. But to you, it is given. And that's an amazing thing, even studying Jonah here in the brief way that we're doing it that God would be pleased to teach us of Christ even through this. Now, I mentioned seven differences, and I'll go over these briefly. First of all, in the willingness to obey. Our Lord never, ever went opposite to what the Father directed. And yet, Jonah, initially, we see him resisting God's direction, attempting to flee. And yet the Lord still causing him to get to Nineveh exactly when he was supposed to. So in that we see a difference. Christ willingly obeyed his father in all things. There's never a time when he didn't. Secondly, Jonah tried to escape from his mission due to a fear of the Assyrians and even a desire for their destruction. Deep down inside, even though he was to declare repentance, yet inside he had an enmity toward them. In that we see a difference with regard to Christ. Christ in coming was motivated by love for his father, love for that people that the father had given him, and the salvation of each one. Thirdly, the nature of Jonah being brought forth from the fish and Christ's resurrection. There's a difference. Jonah's was not a resurrection. His was a physical deliverance. Whereas Christ's resurrection was a resurrection. There was a transformation, just like in resurrection. In the end, we're going to have transformed bodies. We're not going to be what we were before. And so our Lord... When he came forth from the grave, no longer would he be a sin bearer. No longer would he feel the sufferings of this flesh. Jonah, when he came forth from the whale, he had to go back and die again. But Christ came to die one time. And once he had finished the work and accomplished it, it was forever. He is not now the sin bearer. He is in heaven in that glorified state and yet still in an immortal body. And it's that hope that we're told when we die, that we'll be raised again and mortality will take on immortality. We'll be made like him. So there was a difference there, even in Jonah coming forth, it was a physical deliverance, but for Christ, it was a complete transformation of the body that he had in the flesh. It was sinless, 
It had to be when he went to the cross. And yet, when he rose again, it was never to die again. Whereas Jonah would have again faced death. Fourthly, a difference would be in the response to God's mercy. Jonah was displeased. That's what we saw in chapter 4 and verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly when the Lord showed mercy. He was very angry. So Jonah was displeased with God's mercy toward Nineveh. But the Lord Jesus Christ rejoiced in the repentance of sinners. Why? Because he's the one that granted it. And he welcomed them into his kingdom with joy. So there we see a difference. Jonah was a type, but he was a faulty type. Just like all the prophets, priests, and kings of the Old Testament. And that's the reason why we look to Christ as being the fulfillment. But fifthly, we see a def difference even in the prophetic role that each one played. Jonah's function as a reluctant prophet was done so with limited understanding of God's mercy. And the Lord had to use that gourd there in chapter 4, cause it to rise up. And Jonah was content for a while, and then the Lord took it away, prepared a worm, and taught Jonah through that in verse 9 where he says dost thou well to be angry for the gourd he said I do well to be angry even unto death can you imagine it's only the Lord's mercies that were not consumed and here the Lord said thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored neither madest it grow which came up in a night and perished a night should not I spare Nineveh that great city so Jonah was a reluctant prophet with a very limited understanding of God's mercy. But Christ, the ultimate prophet, he is God's prophet. He came fully understanding the purpose of God, show mercy to the worst of sinners and welcomed showing that mercy even through his death that he accomplished. The sixth difference also is between the focus of Jonah's mission and that of our Lord's. Jonah's mission was focused specifically on one city of Nineveh. While our Lord, when he came into this world, it wasn't just to call Jewish sinners to himself, but he had in view of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue that the Father had given him and for whom he laid down his life. Over in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, we see the scope of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he came to accomplish. And in this sense, we can say that it was for the world. It wasn't for every sinner in the world, but sinners throughout the world in the Romans or Revelation 5 9 they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us so there we see the connection with Christ's death and redemption when he died that redemption was accomplished when he died that justification of those sinners was accomplished but who was it for it says hast redeemed us to God by thy blood Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And so there could not have been redemption. There could not have been justification or reconciliation until Christ had accomplished it, even though God had purposed it from before the foundation of the world. But here's the, the scope. Redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So there we see a difference where Jonah specifically was sent to the Ninevites but our Lord came to save sinners out of every tribe, nation, and tongue. And then the obvious difference, number seven, is in the nature of each. Jonah was a human. He was a fallen creature. He was one that would need for Christ when he came to lay down his life for him, that he might be redeemed and justified. And that's where he died in that hope. But the Lord Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. In his divine nature as the son of God. 
And what a difference for us to be able to see in the Lord Jesus Christ all that is necessary, all that is required for God to be just and justify. I thank the Lord for the Jonas and the lessons we learn from him because we can identify as fallen creatures. But oh, how much more do we rejoice in hearing of the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing that as God in the flesh, he perfectly accomplished that salvation for sinners such as we are. And therefore, we have a good hope in him. Well, I hope this is helpful. It's been an interesting study for me to prepare. And I'd encourage you to go back and read and reread again, asking the Lord to even teach you further. Amen.